Hi class, this is your instructor, Mr. Durst, talking, and we are going to go through muscle gross anatomy with our chapter 10 material. So as we're looking at this material, um, we need to focus on functions of the muscles. And our muscles include many different functions. They do a lot of different things with our muscular system. The big ones that I really want to emphasize for you include movement. Muscles make us move. So when we think of our muscles, I want you to think movement muscles. Part of that movement is going to be stability. Um, and as we focus on stability, it's really going to be posture. We maintain our posture. Our muscles help us to not have or to prevent those unwanted movements. <laughs> One of the interesting things is that muscles will help us to stabilize joints. There's been some interesting work done on ACL repair surgeries that has found that individuals with very highly developed quadriceps and uh, hamstrings actually don't need to have an ACL in their knee to maintain their joint stability because their muscles are large enough to compensate for the loss of that key ligament in the knee. Our muscles control passages and open, openings or openings in passageways, specifically sphincters. Or when we think of these, I want you to think of circular muscles. So the muscle fibers have a circular orientation with one band of connective tissue that are all going to be connected to. It's worth mentioning, and it's really hard to downplay it, that when we use our muscles, we make heat. The more you use your muscles, the more heat we're going to generate. Also, we use our muscles to control blood sugar. We have glycemic control. In particular, our muscles are capable of absorbing excess blood sugar, excess glucose, and then we store that extra sugar in the muscles as glycogen, the animal complex carbohydrate, and that can later be utilized by those same skeletal muscle cells that stored it. Um, I want to make sure I'm super clear on this, though. That the muscle, the glucose, which is absorbed in a skeletal muscle fiber or skeletal muscle cell, can only be used within that skeletal muscle cell. It can't be sent back into the bloodstream to be used by other tissue types. Now, in our body, we have lots of muscles, approximately 600-ish muscles, depending on how you slice and dice pun intended, the skeletal muscles in a cadaver, we are not going to cover all 600 skeletal muscles in, or human muscles in the class. Thank goodness. Muscles are a big part of our body. We're about one half skeletal muscle, or one half muscle. Um, this assumes that we have a healthy BMI. Um, here in America, a large percentage of a larger percentage or proportion of our population is becoming obese. So we're finding more and more people are having more and more adipose tissue. Um, as opposed to that skeletal muscle fiber making up a lot of the body mass. There are three kinds of muscular tissue in our bodies. Skeletal is the most numerous. We have cardiac attached to the heart, smooth muscle associated with hollow organs. Skeletal muscle, as its name implies, is a muscle that's going to be attached to a bone of the skeleton. Now, as we look at all these muscles, overall, there's one big purpose. Motion. We want to take chemical energy, ATP, and convert it into movement. As people study muscles and look at ways to optimize muscles and understand the diseases associated with the muscular system, they enter into a field known as myoology. Myo, prefix we're going to see it a lot of in this chapter and the next chapter. Myo means muscle. Um, sarco and mis are also prefixes that mean muscle. But myo is that first one we're going to be introducing right now. It's myology, myology, the study of muscles. Now, as we're looking at a generic skeletal muscle, there's going to be some layers of connective tissues around that. First, we're going to have the epimesium. The epimesium of skeletal muscle is going to be around the outer perimeter of that skeletal muscle fiber. I should switch, switch colors here. Let's go to green. You'll be able to see that better. The epimesium is around the outer perimeter of the skeletal muscle. And then superficial to that epimesium, we have, oops, oh, snap, wrong button. Here we go. We have the fascia. And the fascia and the epimesium have merged together. And that's, they merge together. Um, they are going to form a point or um, going to come together at an apex. And that is going to be a large mass of collagen fibers known as a tendon. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about tendons and ligaments in the next couple chapters. Wait, I want to emphasize this very clearly. Tendons attach muscles to bone, where ligaments attach bones to bone. So we have our first two layers. We have the fat, the tendon that goes to the fascia. The fascia connects to the epimesium. 
And there's some other layers that wrap around these muscles as well. We are going to have an endomesium and perimesium. If we take a, the skeletal muscle as a whole and break it into little groups or chunks that are within it, these chunks are referred to as fascicles. <coughs> and we can define a fascicle as a bundle of muscle fibers. The skeletal muscle as a whole is going to be a bundle of fascicle, and then the fascicle is a bundle of fibers or muscle cells. And holding all of those muscle, muscle fibers or muscle cells together within the fascicle, we have the perimesium. It's worth emphasizing that this perimesium is also going to have a lot of blood vessels present in it. So we can see blood vessels and nerves right here. Nerves and blood vessels are going to be present within that perimesium layer. Wrapped around an individual muscle fiber to help electrically insulate those individual muscle fibers from each other, we're going to have some more connective tissue kind of represented right here um, as this portion that I'm coloring green right now, and that is known as the endomesium. Endo refers to inside, and this is going to be some connective tissue that wraps around individual muscle fibers. It's worth emphasizing that this endomesium electrically insulates one muscle fiber from an adjacent muscle fiber. So we have a unique chemical environment, an electrically charged atom or an ion from one muscle fiber cannot travel to an adjacent muscle fiber because of this endomesium. Let's look at this root word, mes. Here's the second root word of the presentation that refers to muscles. So we had myo on the previous slide, and then on this side we have mes or mes, which is another root word for muscle. Uh, as we look at this prefix right here, peri, peri refers to perimeter. So when we think of the perimesium, this is a membrane that wraps around the outside or the perimeter of the fascicle. So here's a photomicrograph of some skeletal muscle fibers showing us this hierarchy. We have uh, individual skeletal muscle fibers that have been cross-sectionally cut. Over here we have longitudinal sections. I'm going to switch colors to red so we can see that easier. Here we have a cross-sectionally cut skeletal muscle fiber. It's kind of circular-ish in appearance. Here we have longitudinally sliced skeletal muscle fibers. And then wrapped around all of these fibers. We have a bundle of fibers right here. Wrapped around them, we have some connective tissue membranes known as the fascicle. And then in between, I'm gonna go ahead and color it purple for us. In between here, at this purple layer, we have endomesium electrically insulating one skeletal muscle fiber from an adjacent skeletal muscle fiber. We also, as we look at our skeletal muscles, need to be able to classify them based on how their fascicles are oriented. So we have our four, our major categories on the bottom of the screen, fusiform, parallel, triangular, unipennate, bipennate, multipennate, and circular. As we're looking at the fascicle orientation, or the, you could think by extension, the fiber orientation, parallel muscles are going to have, let's shift back to green, let's shift back to green here, doo -doo -doo, are going to have the fascicles be more or less in the same orientation with each other. Classic example of one of these is going to be the rectus abdominis. We also could have a triangular or convergent muscle. So in this situation, we're going to have the fascicles start out with a broad shape and then merge to a spine point. And as we're looking at the triangular muscle, I want to emphasize the pectoralis major as a classic triangular muscle. We also have pennate muscles. And when we look at pennate muscles, they're going to be approximately shaped like a feather. And when we think of this, I want you to look at the tendon here, and then there's going to be a strip of connective tissue going up. And then coming off of that strip of connective tissue, we're going to have individual muscle fibers branching off, just like a feather. So as we look at this one, this is really what I think looks more like a feather, the bipennates. Um, and then we have those fascicles coming up from the band of coll collagenous connective tissue. That's going to give us that feather-like appearance. Unipennate muscles are going to have one tendon 
um, in them, and the fascicles are all going to approach from that one one side of that one tendon. A good example of that is going to be the palmar interosseous. There are actually not that many unipennate muscles in our bodies. When we th or they aren't that large, I should say. We have bipennate muscles. Bipennates are going to have fascicles approaching the single tendon from multiple directions, from two directions, I should say. <coughs> So as we look at this bipennate muscle, the classic example of that is going to be the rectus femoris, which is on the anterior of our thigh. It's also worth emphasizing that these bipennate muscles are going to be very strong muscles. This fiber orientation packs a lot of torque into a very small amount of area. We could also have a multipennate muscle. And in these situations, we have multiple individual tendons that have fascicles coming off of both directions, all converging to the same larger tendon. Or another way you could think of a multipennate muscle is that we have multiple bipennate muscles all merging together with the same tendon to make it a multipennate. We also are going to have circular muscles or sphincters. We have a lot of sphincters in our body that are going to be used to close circular orbit openings in our bodies. We have sphincters around the eye, the orbicularis oculi, we have a sphincter on the mouth, sphincters around the anal openings, um, the urethral openings, any opening in the body that or tubular structure that can close itself off is typically going to have a sphincter associated with it. And that's all we have for this recording. If you have any questions, please feel free to shoot me an email or put it on the discussion board. As always, happy studies.